do you do you guys really not realize like what it means like to have a law against something you know like once you start um like first of all i mean there's just the immediate like massive impact that has on people's lives like people will lose jobs they will become unable to get work um they will like these laws incidentally will always target poorer people because if you're rich you can afford to have you know good lawyers good legal representation which Absolutely. is not going to be available to the poor it's just wild to me when i see people who are like ostensibly on the left look just quite happy to to have you know, to, to sort of allow the expansion of a system which in other contexts they seem to recognize ha it ha has great injustices built into it, you know. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Hey everybody, Magic Skeptic here, and don't worry, the conversation is about to begin. I just wanted to make you aware here in the beginning that what you're about to watch is part one of a two-part conversation between the philosopher KNB and myself, Magic Skeptic. I divided this conversation into two parts because, as philosophers, Kane and I really got into it. We discussed free speech in a remarkably detailed and thorough manner, and in the end, the conversation actually ran for over three hours. Upon re-listening to it, I realized that while we discussed free speech throughout the entire runtime, it became clear that we discussed it in two connected but rather distinct ways. So in part one, what you will hear is a discussion about free speech more broadly or more generally. We discuss its limits, free speech as a moral and ethical principle versus free speech as a legal idea. We discuss censorship and government involvement, and we look at some specific examples of censorship and government involvement. Part two is a very different beast altogether. In part two, we discuss the classical arguments for free speech as proposed by John Stuart Mill. We look at these arguments with respect and with reference to the rather controversial and contemporary example of Joe Rogan. What ensues is a conversation about cancel culture and misinformation. So if that all sounds good, well, I hope you enjoy it. Part two will follow up next week, or if indeed you're watching this in the future, you can watch both parts right away. All I hope, dear listener, is that you enjoy it all. And if you do, please leave a like on this part, part one, and please do the same on part two. And you know, if you enjoy both parts, why not subscribe so that you can hear more awesome conversations just like this one. So without further ado, guys... I give you K and B. Hello, everybody. Magic Skeptic here, aka Magic Dara, and you're all most welcome to another episode of A Magician's Thoughts. I'm joined here today by returning guest K and B from the awesome channel K and B. Uh, K and is a professional philosopher, PhD uh, philosopher. I think K and you're about to. You're graduating soon, although you can tell me more about that in a moment, if I'm not mistaken. You're just at the end of your PhD, which is absolutely phenomenal. What an amazing achievement that is. But we're here today to talk about free speech, a strangely very controversial subject. And uh, I guess we can talk a little bit, Kane, about the strangeness of why it would be controversial to talk about freedom uh, as we progress through the conversation here. But there's much to discuss. There's much to get on with. But I just wanted to start off by welcoming you, Kane. It's great to have you back. Well, you know, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. I mean it. And uh, do you want to just, I mean, just briefly before we jump in, um, what, was I correct there? You're, are you just at the end of your PhD study at this point? Um, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I finished all of the writing and um, I'm waiting now for the oral defense, um, which I hopefully will... I mean, hopefully, be just a sort of formality. Um, it is possible that in the course of that defence, challenges will be raised to what I have written, which require me to go away and do a lot of rewriting. <clears throat> I've been told that that is unlikely to happen. So um, hopefully, I am, in fact, pretty much at the end now. Um, I should be receiving the PhD within the next couple of months, I, I imagine. That's phenomenal. 
that is awesome. And <laughs> can I just add, given I, I dare say my extensive experience of your content on your channel uh, i have every confidence that you will be best placed to orally defend the, the phd dissertation that you've written uh, well, i think you're safe there <laughs> may, maybe although you know like a lot of this so my my content is very planned out you know like i script a lot of it um i honestly i'm not so good on my feet in response to challenges. Um, I have quite a slow brain, uh, uh, which isn't self-deprecating. I just, I just do, right? I think a lot better when I've got time and uh, yeah. rather than on my feet. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, even if I can't respond to challenges, that that probably wouldn't be an issue. It's it's more just like they might have identified something in the text where they're like, oh, you know, this is a big problem. You know, this is a big uh omission or you know you've forgotten to cover some important writer in the field or something like that that can always happen sure um, sure no i understand uh i've been through academia albeit <clears throat> not to the level that you have uh gone to kane my highest degree qualification is a master's which is a, a step down just one step down in the education qualification list but it's a huge step down in other ways um phds are enormously more like there's an there's an enormous amount more expected of you as a phd candidate i i i'm i believe and so i have a sense of academia from having gone to the master's level but <clears throat> yeah i uh i doth my cap to you sir i think that's an amazing achievement and it's an honor to sit here with a an incumbent phd <laughs> holder I, I i do mean that i i hope you don't think i would just say that as a as a triviality it's um it's a pleasure to share the stage with you well thank you thank you for that yeah no no um, as i said the pleasure is all mine kane and to the matter at hand would you agree with my characterization that free speech is becoming an increasingly and rather counterintuitively more provocative and controversial subjects do you agree with that phrasing is that your anecdotal sense of the situation that we find ourselves in in 2022 I'm honestly not sure. And part of the reason why I'm not sure is because it's hard for me to kind of project back to what it might have been like uh, in the past. And I mean, I think that there are, you know, there are certain topics where we can say, OK, like free speech is becoming a big deal with respect to these particular topics. You know, today, right, we talk a lot about things like hate speech. We talk a lot about, say, misinformation on the Internet, which I suppose is something we're going to be focusing on in a bit more detail on that one um and and maybe that was less of an issue you know if you go back like a hundred years ago um i think though it's worth bearing in mind you know when you hear like uh talk of for instance uh free speech being attacked on university campuses that's not my experience right like i it it happens like to some extent i mean um actually at so I'm at the University of Exeter. I believe the University of Exeter was one, their student union um, was one of the student unions who chose to ban Lou Reed's song, Walk on the Wild Side, because they thought it was transphobic, which is ridiculous in so many ways. Um, <laughs> but, uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Like the, the like the like one guy, the one rock star in the 70s who was like literally openly dating a trans woman and who wrote that song for his trans friends yeah. <laughs> was transphobic. OK, but um, that's you know, one so of the arguments that people really don't like, though. Sorry to cut across that. Oh, so, you know, my friend is black, so I can't be a racist. That's an argument that people really, really don't like. And yet I actually agree with Sam Harris's thinking on this. It's it's become unpopular to use that in your defense. Should you be accused of any of these isms, racism or or the phobias, transphobia or homophobia? And yet it, it actually is a, a, a solid defense. A good example of this is the comedian Bill Burr, who is married to a black woman mm -hmm. and he gets routinely called a racist and it feels to me and i agree with sam harris's thinking on this that people who call him a racist and when he says i have a black wife and they say oh really you think you can't be a racist with a black wife 
the people who are still making the allegation, despite him having a black wife, seem to misunderstand what it means to say that one has a genuine and loving marriage, which is what Bill Burr, for all intents and purposes, appears to have. Right. And so, yeah, just to address the point you were making, yeah. right, um, having dated a trans person wouldn't be an exonerating factor for much of what we might call the radical left and their thinking today. But please continue, my friend. I just thought it was a relevant interjection. Yeah, no, that's, there. that's a good point. And uh, I mean, like it, it, the argument isn't isn't like wrong. Right. I mean, somebody could have black friends and still be racist. But, it's sure. just, you know, I mean, the point I'm just making is like uh, <laughs> like that that song was. It's not like there were a bunch of musicians who were cool with trans people back in the 70s. You know, uh, it was uh, like that. That song was pretty much the only one. It, and, it, and it just isn't right. Like, you, could, I mean, you could, it just obviously isn't if you just like read the lyrics. It clearly isn't transphobic. But anyway, uh, that's the point I was making was like, all right, you know, you can look at things like that and say, well, you know, that that looks like an attack on free speech. But on the other hand, these were just student unions. You know, it's not like it was. <laughs> It's not like people would have objected to me listening to the song at the university. It was like student union events wouldn't play the song at their events. It's that kind of thing. Um, my own experience at university was actually people were really quite free to express lots of different ideas. I mean, I know that because I was a teacher, right? I mean, I taught at the university. Um, we had to cover topics that would be pretty controversial. Um, so, like, I taught... Uh, in one class, we we did some stuff on like feminist philosophy, and uh, I remember uh, sort of br bringing up like ideas about you know the differences between men and women and what might explain those differences. Like maybe some of them are, uh, are best explained in sort of more biological terms. Biological you know, essentialism, right? Yeah, these these are controversial. I did, it was never a problem sort of talking about them openly and you know working through the best arguments for and against them and so on. So. I mean, I, I never really experienced that. And then I look, look back in the past and I look at, you know, Bertrand Russell, right, getting fired from university for uh, ex positions that he expressed on marriage, right? I'm thinking, well, you know, is, is free speech really more under threat today or is it just that we've, th there, are, there are different kinds of threats, right? And there are different kinds of things that we focus on. Um, I mean, I'm, 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 so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Do you know what? I, 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 I think it's a totally fair point you've raised. And when one factors in the amplification effect, if you will, that social media plays in this entire conversation, where the algorithms of various social media platforms, if not all of them, are designed to echo our own concerns and worldviews back at us. And so a person can quite conceivably have a very flawed sense of the zeitgeist or the paradigm in which they're living because they're having their own view fed back at them ad infinitum on a daily mm -hmm. basis. And so, yeah, I, do you know what? I think it's totally fair. I would have to join you. I'm not sure either. I'm not sure either. I can't quantify where what's actually going on begins and where social media and the algorithm ends. And as you pointed out, Kane, it's 2022 and I'm 30 years of age. I was born in 1991. And so I don't have a good sense of what the free speech you know, paradigm was like in the medieval period. I don't have a good sense of what the free <laughs> speech paradigm was in the 50s. I, can I don't think they had <laughs> in, the <medieval> <laughs> in the medieval period, <laughs> sure, fair enough. But you know what I mean? Yeah. When we go back through history, it's it's quite difficult to quantify how how much more or less freedom we have, because as you pointed out, it kind of depends on the topic. I mean, granted, yes, if you go to the medieval period, we're probably less free in every conceivable measure, sure. But uh, are we less free in every conceivable measure compared to the 80s? That's not <laughs> clear, I guess. Is it? Well, I mean, that's your point, right? Yeah, I, I like I say, I, I really... It's with respect to what, right? I Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, there are definitely yeah. sort of challenges that exist today that didn't exist in the 80s. But you know, again, you can always find, um, like back in the 80s, what was going on? Um, you know, I, think, I think back in the 80s in Britain, we had those uh, uh, video nasty bands, as they were called, they were called video nasties, you know, films like Cannibal Holocaust and stuff that 
Um, a film I've never watched and never will, by the way, because I've heard that there's animal torture in it and I just can't abide that, um, I'm afraid. I've seen Cannibal Holocaust. I don't, I don't remember that. There might, there's, there might apparently be. there is a scene with a turtle. Yeah, it was a while ago I saw it. Yeah, um, apparently there is a quite an egregious scene with the turtle and it is just popular knowledge at this point that the scene was filmed for real and that the torture that that's visited upon the creature is real. And uh, one, we could have a very long conversation about my hypocrisy there because I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegan. And so one could say, oh, but what about, you know, that yeah. burger you ate at McDonald's, Magic Skeptic? Aren't you kind of inconsistently applying your animal your care ethic, if you will? And, you know, I'm open to all those arguments. But look, if only as a matter of disgust and revulsion, yeah. I would feel I can't possibly watch Cannibal Holocaust. It's not on the table <laughs> well, for me. It doesn't, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. It's not like there's anything necessarily inconsistent about saying, well, I just don't want to see it. Um, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, that is so, the position I've had to retreat to, basically, because I can't justify my <laughs> ethics on the animal front unless I become a vegan or a vegetarian. But again, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> but like, you know, this is this is a fair enough point, right? I mean, um, based on the sort of values people have today, um, yeah, like I think people would ob object to, to that film on those grounds. But th those were not the grounds that it was objected to uh, in, in the 80s, right? It no. was just like, yeah. you know, well, this is going to lead to sort of moral degradation, moral corruption. You have yeah. people like, um, you know, Mary Whitehouse, who was this sort of, you know, moral campaigner um, who... Uh, I, I know of her only because I'm a big fan of Doctor Who, um, classic series of Doctor Who, and uh, she had a big influence on, you know, the uh, getting the amount of violence in the series reduced. And of course, when you go back and watch that now, it's just like, I mean, it's just, you just think like, what? <laughs> I mean, you watch those like Doctor Who uh, episodes from, you know, from the 70s, and <laughs> I mean, they're so, so tame. Yeah. Um, compared to, you know, some of the media around today. That, quite innocent, in fact. Yeah. Quite, yeah. quite innocent, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, it's like, I, I, I don't know. And you've also got to kind of, I don't know if this is maybe bringing up a, a completely different topic, but um, you sort of have to weigh this against as well, like, you know, okay, maybe we have reduced freedom with respect to things like, hate speech um but there's a it, it's, it's not entirely obvious to me like it you know when, when we sort of talk about freedom in general it's like well you know there is a point to be made um that when you sort of have this is just something that i've experienced right so i'm just going to frame this in terms of my own experiences i uploaded a video on david hume it was called why was hume racist right and um it, it, like there's no question that Hume was racist. Uh, he, he clearly, he clearly was. I was interested in just exploring why, because Hume was really radical in so many ways. You know, he was um, not quite coming out in favor of atheism, but he was pretty close to defending atheism. You know, um, I mean, he's kind of open to interpretation on that front. But even being open to interpretation at the time he was writing was, you know, pretty, pretty radical. Um, and he was certainly, you know, challenging a lot of religious arguments. He, he gave such powerful arguments against you know, ideas that we all take for granted, like our ability to make inductive inferences. A anyway, you know, he's so radical and so challenging in so many ways. Um, and then he just comes out with this, like, obviously terrible argument. I mean, it's just, so it's obviously... Is this when he stupid. referred to uh, people of other ethnicities as descendant from ignorant and barbarous nations and this kind of stuff? Is that right, what you're right. referring to? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not like he gave, he didn't give really detailed arguments on this, but what he said was just really stupid. And I'm like, okay, yeah. well, you know, you, you can just dismiss it and say, well, he was just a man of his time, which is, I think, quite fair enough. I mean, that's a reasonable response. But I was just I was interested to tr sort of try to think a bit more carefully about, well, why did Hume make such a big mistake about this? So I, I uploaded a video on it. And what happened was is that the comments were just flooded with racists. Like, and I'm oh, not talking dear. about, you know, like uh, Charles Murray bell curve type racists. You know, I mean, like just outright, like, well, you know, like blacks are necessarily ignorant and violent. Oh that sort my of racism, god! Right? And so, I I then sort of had a choice because I'd always been really hands off with the comments, and it was like the problem is that 
number one, if I allow this to sort of spread on my channel, then it's probably just going to make people who are not racists and the people who are being like targeted from the racism, you know, black people and so on, it's going to make them feel very unwelcome. Like they're not going to want to be here. They're going to, they're going to go away. So it's like, going to start uh, feeling like a clan meeting. Right, exactly. Now, if you're if if you imagine being like a black person at a clan meeting, are you going to feel able to just like speak up and express your opinions freely? I mean, so you know, so there was that, and it's also that. Well, I have a channel which is like educational. It's viewed by people all around the world. Um, it's viewed I, like it's viewed by people in that context. You know, in the context of like, you know, we're doing a course. My videos, I know, are um, suggested by teachers, right? Because I've been told by some teachers, they'll direct their students to my videos. So like, I, I feel like they are in, in an indirect way, part of that environment. Um, so I, I felt like, okay, I, uh, given these points, I can't just let a bunch of racists like spam my channel. Um, yeah. So I, I just have to put a stop to it. And I ended up turning off the comments on that video. And I, wow. I, I now have this stance where it's like, yeah, I mean, like, I'm just going to block racists. Um, and they can make a reasonable point that, you know, I've reduced the freedom of speech. Um, I mean, I have, like, I'm preventing them from expressing their views on my platform. Um, but it seems like you also have to consider that there's such a thing as freedom of association. That seems really important as well. So the point of this long story is... That's a wonderful well, story. It's a really, yeah. really good one. The point of this is, you know, when we talk about like just freedom in general, you, you can't necessarily maximize all of it. You know, if you want to promote freedom of association and the ability of people to like enter into communities that realize their values, you might have to reduce freedom of speech. Um, that's perhaps a sad fact, but that's the way it is. I can see people who are watching this video uh, kind of screaming at the screen already and saying, oh, but no, Kane, you didn't reduce freedom of speech. You just expressed your own freedom. You didn't make it illegal for them to say <laughs> what they were saying. You were simply uh, expressing your right of freedom of association. That's nothing to do with freedom of speech. But as you quite rightly point out in your channel, in a video that has been quite influential in my views, Freedom of speech is about more than simple legal barriers on mm -hmm. speech because, and I'm going to quote you here, Ken, you'll recognize your own words here. And if I mangle your explanation here, please jump in and save me. But you put a wonderful hypothetical in one of your videos, uh, a video that's going to become integral to the conversation as we move forward here, where you detail John Stuart Mill's arguments or defenses for speech. You put forward a hypothetical where imagine a society where, um, say, for example, a Christian society where it's not illegal to be an atheist. There's no law on the books that says it's illegal to be an atheist. Atheists will be arrested, et cetera, et cetera. But if in this society an admission of one's atheism is tantamount to complete social isolation and ostracization and losing one's job, for example, well, then that is a society that doesn't have freedom of speech with respect to secularism and dissenting voices that are anti-theistic or atheistic in nature. It's not about and, and it is about laws as well, but it's not only about laws. A society can be anti-free speech without having a single anti-free speech statute on the books. Would mm -hmm. that be a fair summary? Yeah. Um, so when I talk about free speech, unless otherwise specified, I I mean it as a sort of general kind of moral or social principle. Yes. Um, and that's the way that it has been discussed, you know, by a lot of people in in, in the sort of liberal tradition, let's say, certainly by John Stuart Mill. Um, it is a little bit frustrating uh, that whenever any conversation happens about free speech, you get a bunch of people saying, well, you know, this doesn't count because it's not a law. And there's this really annoying meme from XKCD. And I, am I, have I got that right? Or is it X? No, it is. I think it's XKCD. What's and that? Uh, what, what's, you've lost me there now. XK XKCD is like, a, he, he produces these, I really like him. Um, he produces these sort of funny comics. I think he was a scientist. And um, let me just, let me just check I'm getting that right. Um, 
Take I, time. There's absolutely no panic. <laughs> I, uh, it, it won't take me too long. XKCE. Is this yeah, a, yeah, he's, he's really is cool. This he's an like, academic or a scientist? Or it's, a not, it's not academic, no. It's just, it's just like this kind of webcomic. Um, ah, I see. And a it sort of has very like simple illustrations and so on. And a lot of them are really funny. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're like, okay, the subject matter of the comic varies from statements on life and love to mathematical programming and scientific in-jokes. So... Oh. Yeah, and and it's um, but there's there's this there's this meme which uh, I can't remember the exact details of, but it kind of expresses in very simple terms this point about you might have actually seen the meme, um, but maybe you just sort of didn't recognize it for what yeah. it was, perhaps. Yeah, um, and it's it's sort of like you know, okay, the right to free speech. Here it is. I'm just I'm just speaking what it what it says. Sure. Um, it's not funny. This one. Uh, it's a. Uh, <laughs> Public service announcement. The right to free speech means the government can't arrest you for what you say. It doesn't mean that anyone else has to listen to your bullshit or host you while you share it. The First Amendment doesn't shield you from criticism or consequences. If you're yelled at, boycotted, have your show cancelled or get banned from an internet community, your free speech rights aren't being violated. It's just that the people listening think you're an asshole and they're showing you the door. Um, which is, I mean... <laughs> it's actually a fair argument. But, Which is, 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 is true, right? Like, but if you, but you can't terms, say that that's a status quo that abides by the moral and social principle of free speech. No. So like, I agree with all of those things that society can do. I mean, I agree with by I, I don't agree with every boycott, but I agree with the principle that people can boycott. I agree with yeah. the principle that people can freely associate or not. I agree with all those principles. But if a society collectively does that in relation to a particular voice or opinion or idea, then that is a society that isn't living out the moral and social principle of free speech. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just calling it for what it is. That's a society that is less free in terms of speech. And, um, and it's, it sounds like you agree, right? Well, well, well uh, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I think that that kind of thing is, um, I mean, it's fair enough to focus on government censorship. That is an important thing to be concerned about. But, Agreed. Um, you Agreed. know, um, it, yeah, if, if you look at like the classic arguments for free speech, a lot of them are more broadly concerned with, you know, this, this kind of moral point about like, well, how how do we just as individuals forget about the state? Like, how do we sort of choose to deal with, interact with opinions that we find like may perhaps dangerous, you know, or, or you know, offensive or, or whatever? Like it's yep. it's concerned with that. Um, and I, I think it's just frustrating when like that debate, people try to just sort of shut that down by saying, well, you know, no, if you're talking about free speech, it has to be about, you know, it has to be about the law, which by the way, um, for you and I, it, this is, I mean, like, how can it be about that? We don't have a First Amendment. Like, we, it's, it's not like, that's just, um, that's just the USA, right? Yeah. We don't actually have like a principle of free speech written into the Constitution in nope. the way that the USA does. In fact, so, we have the opposite. Yeah. We have the opposite. I told you about this off air the last time we met. And I remember you being shocked and appalled by some of the details I give you. But let me just reiterate for the sake of the audience here. Um, I have been covering the free speech issue for some time on my channel, and uh, I covered two specific instances which are just absolutely horrifying for anybody who has a sympathy towards the free speech um, kind of sentiment that Cain and I are advocating for here. And one was of a preacher, a vicar, who was uh, standing up in a public square here in the United Kingdom and preaching about the sinfulness of gay marriage. He was not organizing a program against the gay community. He was not uh, advising that we assault, harm or kill or hurt anyone. He was just explaining from his religious perspective that gay marriage is not what God wants. Now, I think he's abhorrent. I disagree with him. I voted in favor of gay marriage when that referendum came up in Ireland, and I was very proud of my little country when it passed with flying colors. I'm a very progressive, left-leaning individual. I disagree with this gentleman, but he did not deserve what happened next. He was dragged, I dare say violently, dragged away by the police and detained and arrested under what is known as Section 5 of the Public Order Act, which makes it an offense to say anything within earshot of any person that can make them feel hurt feelings. The other example I covered on my channel was of a woman who was staging a protest with another 
group of people against Boris Johnson, our current prime minister at the time of recording. For how long more that'll last, we shall see. Um, but um, she was wearing a T-shirt that said F, F-U-C-K, F Boris. And a police officer uh, questioned her and was detaining her and was going to arrest her unless she removed or covered up said T-shirt. And the thing, and this is all on my channel, if anybody wants to check these videos, I'll put them in the description below. The police officer reads Section 5 of the Public Order Act directly to this woman, and he says, the reason I'm detaining you is because of that word. You know that word is offensive and that it's going to hurt people's feelings, and so I have to arrest you uh, and detain you if you don't remove it. And I feel, and it seems like you agree with me, Kane, but I am shocked and appalled by these instances. I'm shocked on behalf of these people, despite the fact I agree, by the way, with the second story. I, I think, yeah, F Boris. Right? Mm -hmm. I have lots of bones to pick with Boris Johnson. Again, a conversation for another day, perhaps not really pertinent right now. Um, it wouldn't matter even if I didn't agree with her. She shouldn't be arrested for saying F a particular politician. Now, if she had a T-shirt that said, let's go and murder a particular person, that's different. That is quite different and distinct. And again, it's something that we'll get into later in the conversation. What is your reaction to those stories? There are more, Kane, but what is your reaction? Do you share my outrage with, with this absence of free speech that we have in this country? Because like you said, we don't have the same rights that they have in the United States. Um, yeah, so I, I should actually just, just clarify. Um, am, I, am I to avoid offensive language? I think as I was reading out that meme, I might have just uh, used the language in it. There are certain words so. I'm going to try my best to avoid just for the sake so the video doesn't get a strike against it or something. So okay. um, mm -hmm. I probably should have said that. But to be honest, I don't normally put rails on a conversation, but I'm going to avoid um, the uh, flu that we'll be speaking about shortly. I won't be mentioning the C word. Um, the flu, the the pandemic that has plagued us for the last two years, I'll be referring to it as the C word, or or the I was thinking about calling it the C flu, which I thought was quite clever. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm also going to avoid the phrase anti VAX because again, that kind of conversation gets videos struck out immediately. Um, I don't mind F-bombs and things. I try not to use them um, as a general rule of thumb. Uh, every now and then I get angry in one of my videos and I'll leave out an F-bomb here and there, but I try my best to be polite. But I'm not putting shackles on you at all, Kane. You speak freely, my friend, because this is a free speech <laughs> platform, uh, at least for me. I mean, maybe YouTube isn't, and again, we can get into that. But um, please, please speak freely, my friend. I don't want to curtail your original thinking here because that I wouldn't have brought you on uh, if okay, I well, wanted you to wear gloves and not tell us what you really think. I'll I'll bear that in mind. I I'm not really look. You know, I'm not really the kind of person who comes out fighting, telling people what I really think. Uh, <laughs> 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 but how do you um, feel about those those stories? No, um, did, did they? Do they shock you? Do they appall you? Oh, oh yeah. No, this is a good example of why, despite what I said about how I see free speech as, you know, as we should we should view it as a broader moral principle. It is also important to like bear in mind there is something uniquely awful about um, about government censorship. Um, yes. Like so, so yeah. I mean, I I don't like. I mean, I'm not sure what I can say other than. You know, I find that sort of thing horrifying. I think I, I would say, you know, I have the impression that there are lots of people who. I mean, I, I don't know how common the sentiment is. But I feel like there's just a lot of people like when it comes to that, you know, pastor who was expressing the. Um, the, the, Kane, the, the anti you, broke, you broke up. You broke up there slightly, so could oh. you just start that sentence again? When it comes to just when it take comes it to when the it comes to pastor who was expressing the anti-gay sentiment, um, that kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of people who are like quite happy with, you know, restrictions against hate speech and so on. Um, when I feel like those same people should, you know, recognise just how kind of horrifying the. Uh, the penal system as it currently exists actually is. I, I, I you know, this came up a lot when I was, um, I, I used to see people argue about like, um, cases like, uh, uh, what was his name? The fellow who uploaded the, the dog that was a Nazi. 
and he was oh yes 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 yeah. i can't um, remember his name but he, he basically trained the dog to yeah. r- basically like do a, a salute or something wasn't it yeah i uh, it was it was crazy but yeah um yeah he got cancelled didn't he basically well yeah. he didn't get cancelled he got prosecuted he specifically got arrested and prosecuted right okay <laughs> so i i uh, that'll tell you how much i knew about that particular one i didn't look into that one myself Kane, yeah. but that sounds horrifying to be yeah, honest yeah I, I think the case lasted like 2 years or something and um of... you know people sort of afterwards i think in the end he only got fined um and there were lots of people who were like well you know i mean like yeah that's uh, like is that really a big deal i mean you know he was sort of putting up, you know, what, like this Nazi um, material, which, I mean, it, it wasn't, it was an obvious joke, but like, you know, even if it was, I think that, like, do you, do you, do you guys really not realise, like, what it means, like, to have a law against something? You know, like, once you start, um, like, first of all, I mean, there's just the immediate, like, massive impact that has on people's lives. Like, people will lose jobs. They will become unable to get work. Um, they will like these laws incidentally will always target poorer people because if you're rich you can afford to have you know good lawyers good legal representation which is not going to be available to the poor it's just wild to me when i see people who are like ostensibly on the left look just quite happy to to have you know to, to sort of allow the expansion of a system which in other contexts they seem to recognize Ha, it ha, has great injustices built into it, you know. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'm horrified by those kinds of cases, and I think people should be more horrified by them um, than they are. Uh, I don't have the feeling like that, that there's a lot of really kind of pro free speech sentiment um, here in the UK. Maybe that's just the sort of crowds that again that i'm involved with but you know like i never heard about this case with the pastor but you know with the case of uh, the the fellow who uploaded the dog i didn't really meet a lot of people who had a problem with it you know um, yes i mean i think people and i will acknowledge this people collectively kind of saw the joke as being in very poor taste and I agree, but that I have to acknowledge is a subjective judgment. I didn't find it particularly funny. You know, I, I, I was like, wow, <laughs> Did he actually trained his dog to do that. Christ above. <laughs> like I was actually just a bit taken aback by it. Um, so the joke was in poor taste. But again, like you said, it was a joke and getting arrested and or fined for it seems to be obscene yeah. to me. But are, are we just making an intuitional point there? Because I can I can hear the left wing voices. And again, I identify as left. I'm just not so left that I'm radical, right? But I can hear left wing voices in the audience, and I'd love to get your reaction to this, Ken. They will say something like, almost coming back to our previous conversation, almost like a categorical ought. They will say something like, yes, but there are some things that one ought not joke about. There are certain conversations, uh, there are certain topics, and there are certain um, historical events, like the Holocaust, right, <laughs> that one ought not joke about. How do you respond to that? What is your thinking on that? I should say, first of all, I mean, I, I think that the, the right do this as well. Um, I'm not sure why the left have allowed, you know, allowed, but like, uh, somehow the right seem to have, you know, taken up this, like, image that they're defenders of free speech, which is is insane to me. I, I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> Just to clarify my comments, because I, I think I'm going to agree with everything that you're about to say. But with respect to censoring humor and jokes, that does appear to be uh, a left wing phenomenon, unless you're about to enlighten me here. I'm not aware of any right wing demand for jokes to be censored but you are right if all you mean or at least in my from what i'm aware of you are right in so far as the right does want to censor other conversations on oh yeah no i subjects. i'm just talking generally here I, I, sure the, sure I, um so you know i'm i'm just thinking of like other cases where i mean again i i know more about what's like 
going on in academia, but I know that in academia, although it's often presented as, oh, you know, these social justice warriors are like, uh, you know, shutting down speech on campus. No, like that's coming from the right, maybe even more than it's coming from the left. Um, but yeah, I, so um, could you just before the, you move on there, Ken, could you just elucidate on that briefly? Because I know a lot of people in the audience are going to have a Scooby Doo moment can, there. Okay, and kind I, of can, go, hmm. I can. I, but I in mean, what like, sense are the hard. right shutting down speech on campuses? Because that that's that would be quite illuminating to, so, to get some insight on that. Yeah, because I made a kind of relative claim where I'm like, well, it's coming from them just as much, maybe more than it is from the left. It's like it's it's hard to substantiate that. But I can I can you know give you like you know links or whatever that you can put up that sure give sure. examples. Of this. Here's here's one example. It yeah, one example recently. would suffice just um, for now. That would be there awesome. There was a, a, a there's a uh, philosopher called Stephen Kirshner who ironically is I think actually right wing. He certainly sort of leans right on a lot of issues. I mean, like he's 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 literally written papers in defense of discrimination, right? Like in defense of discriminating against women in employment. Um, I mean, I I might have been. <laughs> That might not be his exact position. It might be a little bit more subtle than that, but his it's it's close to that, right? Like he's <laughs> he's, he's ball park. right? Yeah. So, um, but anyway, uh, oh, one of the Christ. things that he talks about is, um, and I, I wonder if this is a topic that again you might not want to say the name of, given. But let's say um, uh, adult child relations. Yes. 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 Right. I, I'm. I'm with um, you. And he's sort of asked, okay, what's wrong with this, right? Like, I mean, everybody thinks that it is wrong. Um, and actually he thinks it's wrong as well. Um, and, but he, he wants to investigate why. He wrote a book about it. And actually he thinks that a lot of the standard justifications don't work. Uh, he uploaded, well, he, he appeared on a podcast called, I think they're called Brains in a Vat. Um, Great. And, you know, they were, they were talking about this. They were like, all right, like, you know, what's, the, you know, what are the justifications? What's the problem with the standard justifications that people give? Um, and so his views are like, they're very challenging. Um, but there was this sort of social media campaign. Uh, it, it started through a Twitter account called Libs of TikTok, I think. I think that was the name. So this is like, you know, obviously some conservative like going through uh, videos they can find of people that they think are libs um, expressing opinions they disagree with. I, I, I imagine that's what it is. But anyway, it's it, they uploaded some clips of him speaking about this. And yeah, there was this like massive campaign, this call to get him fired. And what was horrifying was that the university just capitulated. They didn't fire him, but they were like, you know, yeah, we we sort of strongly disavow his statements. We are investigating this matter and they removed him from teaching duties. I right. see. This so is, people, on happened, right, people on the right, people on the right were demanding this. Yeah, this was a, a right wing, like this was a movement. right wing movement uh, yeah. to uh, get Cancel him fired. Him. And Cancel they him. successfully got him removed from teaching. Uh, I don't know what the outcome of that investigation is going to be. I, as far as I am aware, what the university did was actually illegal um, because he's at a state university. He's protected by the First Amendment. Um, I believe that's the case. I could be wrong about that because I don't know the intricacies of American law. Um, I hope it's the case. I hope that the uh, I hope that university. I hope that the, the dean of that university is fired uh, uh, because that's horrifying. And like, you know, yeah. So there are no point taken, Ken. Yeah, point taken. There, there I think I, of, of no, I, I, uh, who are who are just as bad. No, I, I do you know what? I, I think that is such. I'm so happy um, that I asked you about that and that you've given us an example because I think there is a general feeling out there, and it's 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 something like that. What you said, the right wing is the darling of free speech, and that the left is is the the side of of you know censorship and unjust authoritarianism with respect to speech and arrest and um, detainment for uttering mere words and so on and examples like that are just useful for anybody who might be operating with that software in their mind right now anybody who watches this video and had the you know unchallenged unfettered assumption that the left is the you know the the political um kind of anti-free speech um, kind of proponent. Well, there you go. It, it can come from both sides. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's that's really useful. 
the left haven't done themselves any favors though um i would i, I would say that. that i mean like i and again i this is something that i encounter so often whenever people talk about free speech if there's anybody if you ever find somebody like mocking the very idea of free speech it's probably going to be coming from someone who's a leftist um have, have you ever seen it when people like will do this thing where they they'll go like mer freeze peach i don't know if you've seen that this is something it's like I haven't seen the, that, but I, I've heard similar people do it when they go, America, you know, free speech. They do a, a, a shoddy southern accent and uh, mm -hmm. t and kind of satirize free speech at, as though it is the the mangled tool of southern hicks. If so. <laughs> and, and, and that's not me, by the way, saying that people in the south are just hicks. Uh, I am not offering any comment on the intellectual fortitude or demographics of the, the southern states at all. I'm just pointing out that I've seen people on the left kind of trivialize and, and make fun of free speech as though it were an irrelevancy and as though mentioning the phrase is tantamount to admitting one's bigotry. And that's just an absolute insane status quo. But again, going back to the opening of our conversation, Ken, I can't quantify where the reality of that begins where my anecdotal experience ends and how social media algorithms factor yeah. into it. I find myself being unable to put my finger on the pulse and figure out what the actual paradigm is that I'm living in. All I can say is that I have met people, seen people, witnessed people, read, seen on Twitter, seen on TikTok, seen in so many different domains where people belittle free speech as though to stand up in favor of free speech is tantamount to one's own bigotry, racism or homophobia or what have you. And maybe I'm seeing that because the social media algorithms have been set up so that I see that more often. I don't know. But when I do see it, all I can say is that I'm horrified because free speech is not a triviality and it's not something that is just an admission that is tantamount to one's bigotry. It's, it's such a, a deeply important thing, which is, I, I guess, where we're going with this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's a shame that, you know, it's, it's almost like in response to conservatives sort of using this like language of free speech, there's a lot of leftists who are like, oh, well, you know, we're opposed to free speech then. It's like they're almost accepting the terms yeah. of the debate set by conservatives, whereas I yes. think it should be like, no, I, like we should embrace free speech and, you know, we should show the, like the, so you know there's this such a long history of like free speech being so integral to you know um like you know the liberation of oppressed groups and so on or so it seems to me you know it, it seems to be to be fundamentally a more left-wing value um I, I, that's how i see it anyway and i think it's a shame that um so many people seem willing to just sort of concede that to like let the conservatives take it away from us yeah. I can see a lot of people taking issue with the claim that it's more of a left wing value. Um, if I if I may, I'll, you know, quote a, a rather controversial figure here, Jordan Peterson. I don't quote Jordan Peterson a lot because, quite frankly, I find a lot of Jordan Peterson's positions to be ridiculous. Um, now I've just put my foot in it, haven't I? I'm going to have the Jordan Peterson fans in the comments below hating me. But uh, if anybody wants me to make a video on that, I can go in more depth. But one thing he did say that I, I, it really struck a chord with me. I'd, I'd actually be very curious to get your reaction to this, Kane. Peterson said one time that people very, very easily recognize the extremes of the right wing. They very easily recognize the extremes of the right wing. You know, your Ku Klux mm. Klan or... Um, your bloody, I don't know, Nazi or what have you, right? Um, but people don't so easily recognize the extremes of the left. Like people think that if you go extremely left, you just get vegan. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, if you go far enough left, you actually get Stalin. You actually get the gulag. You get communism, right? If you go far enough that direction, I don't know how you'll react to that. I don't know how you're gonna what you're gonna say at all. Again, none of this, guys. Just for the benefit of the listener at home, none of this has been pre-planned. We're very much free flowing here. I do have things written down. I haven't even gotten to them yet because this conversation is so riveting. But when you say, Cain, when you say that free speech seems to be something that's more typical of a left-wing value. 
someone could argue, and I'm not so sure if it's true, but uh, again, I'm just curious about your reaction here. Someone could argue that perhaps you're guilty of what Peterson was pointing out there, that you're more in tune with right-wing atrocities and you're more easily able to recognize extremists on the right and maybe not so good at recognizing extremists on the left. Do you think that could be a feature of your thinking there and why you might say such a thing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always possible. Um, I'm I'm entirely open to that. I mean, I think it's very hard to sort of get past one's own biases, especially when it comes to political views, because sure, I, I don't I don't really know how to avoid this problem that we've pointed out before of like, you know, we all kind of exist in these echo chambers, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I take the point. Um, I, so when I say that I see it more as a as a left wing value, I, I should say first of all, like I, just because I live in the West, right? Like I'm thinking of the history his, history of certain countries, right? Um, yeah, maybe if I live in Russia, um, I would have a different take. Although frankly, the you know the right wing in Russia doesn't look too good either. So you know, uh, but um, yeah. So oh, anyway, Christ. what's what's my point? Look, I'm just you know. <laughs> I think the thing is this, right? When I think about like what's the sort of fundamental motivation of, you know, of like, of of leftism, right? Of of the kind of left movements throughout history, it seems to be about you know resisting or trying to break down hierarchies. Um, and again, I know people can be like, oh well, what about the Soviet Union? And so it's like, yeah, I I, I get that point, right? I, the, 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 these ideals have been, you know, used by, or, you know, have manifested in ways. It's like, you can resist hierarchies, right? But, but then it can go wrong and you can end up like instituting a, a, a terrible oppressive hierarchy yourself. That's happened. That, that, that's why it's a political horseshoe, right? <laughs> like the, le- the, the reason that political uh, differences are expressed in a horseshoe is because if you go too far left, you eventually come back in closer to the right again. When you go too far right again, it, it kind of, you know, the extremes are remarkably similar to one another, basically, right? But if you just think about like the ideals that these people expressed, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's what it is. I think it's about, you know, breaking down hierarchies. It's about democratization. Um, it's about like bringing power to the people. And I see free speech as being part of that. Certainly, I see, you know, resisting government censorship as being part of that. Um, What's it, what, what about libertarianism, so, though? Because libertarianism is kind of a right wing. Like, essentially, the message of libertarianism is just leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want government involvement. And libertarians tend to be free speech fundamentalists. Yeah. Because uh, they don't want any, you know, governmental rules, oversight or anything. Uh, they don't, I mean, radical libertarians don't even want oversight when it comes to, you know, building and, um, you know, ar- architecture and the market will sort it all out. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced by the libertarian message. I think there's truth in libertarianism. I think there's wisdom in libertarianism, especially when it comes to free speech, uh, which again, we'll get to. But um, isn't libertarianism more a phenomenon of the right than it is of the left? Well, libertari- s- libertarianism sort of has this slightly you know, schizophrenic history in a way. I mean, it began as very firmly left wing. Um, you know, today when you use a phrase like libertarian socialism, um, yeah. some people say it's an oxymoron, right? But sure. if you go back, you know, to the sort of early 1900s, you say libertarian socialism, that would be a tautology. Uh, it's like, well, yeah, of course, of course, like libertarianism just is a left wing, a left wing movement. Um, I'm, I'm just you know, thinking of people like Ben anarchism. Shapiro and Dave um, Rubin, you know, who are like, yeah, you're, you're right. libertarians, so, you know. In the United States, uh, as far as I understand, um, the term, I think, I think that what happened, I, I, I mean, I could be wrong about the history here. So what happened is, you know, you have these like two approaches to socialism, where on the one hand, you had the kind of welfare state socialists. And on the other hand, you had the libertarian, the anarchist socialists, who were focused more on like direct action, strikes, mutual aid, right? That, that stuff can, is, you know, really disruptive. The welfare state socialists were like, well, you know, you can, you can essentially maintain the sort of system of property rights that we have, we can maintain like capitalist control of, you know, industries, right, that sort of thing. But then you institute a welfare state to alleviate the conditions that are, you know, producing revolution. So you had these two things. And then 
with when the welfare state socialists sort of won the argument, right? Well, then that creates the space for a kind of right wing libertarianism, which is in favor of small government against the welfare state. Does yeah. that does that make sense? I think. And so I think that that's where like this, you know, right wing libertarianism. Yeah, emerged. yeah. I think the way you described it is wonderful, actually, um, that libertarianism has a kind of schizophrenic history of sorts. Um, and so you can kind of see a, a, a one foot in one political aisle, whereas the other foot is kind of in the other uh, in today's um, kind of political paradigm. It's just interesting. Um, I just wanted to examine, if only for a moment, Cain, because uh, I think my my listeners would um, would have some very choice words for me if I if I didn't examine and push back on uh, some of the statements and a statement yeah, that, <laughs> a statement that um, definitely caught my um, ear there and probably the ear of a lot of listeners was the idea that free speech might actually be more of a left leaning quality. Um, in any case, I think um, I think that was uh, an interesting over and back there. Um, is there anything else you want to add there, Kane, before we get on to the um, what I was hoping to get to, actually, which is the defense of free speech? Is there anything else you'd like to add there before we proceed? I, I, I think that I I don't think so. I mean, I, I would say, like, look, I, I I'm saying all of this stuff. Like, I'm really not that sure. Um, I don't want to make that clear. Right. Like, yeah. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm well aware of, uh, you know cognitive biases and the sort of my own kind of massive ignorance of uh, like I'm speaking incidentally you know you said I was a PhD student I should say I'm a PhD student in philosophy of science I don't really know anything about any of this stuff <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well I and I'm not professing to be uh, an expert in any of this either uh, I just think the conversation is fascinating and you know my expertise are in comparative religions your expertise are in the philosophy of science, as you put it. I think, if nothing else, it's interesting for two such individuals to have a conversation about the state of free speech and uh, its importance. Mm -hmm.